Live here at the Little Wall, presented by Lexus of Reno. We're here every Wednesday night talking Wolfpack football with head coach Brian Polian. This week, the Wolfpack on the road. Their final road game coming up on Saturday as the Pack will be in Fort Collins to take on Colorado State. That game uh, kicks off at 1230 Pacific time on Saturday afternoon. We'll be on the air with the Bud Light Tailgate Show beginning at 11 o'clock. Talk about that game coming up. We'll get some of our questions from Twitter. If you'd like to ask your questions of Coach Polian, you can tweet them to at Nevada Wolfpack. Use the hashtag ask the pack and we'll get your questions on the air coming up a little bit later on coach before we talk about uh, what's coming up this week in colorado state let's go back and uh, review last week's game against uh, fresno state another one of those games that kind of seemed like a tale of two halves where some struggles in the first half but your guys came back played very hard in the second half hung in against a really good fresno state team what do you take away from uh, the game last saturday in fresno well there were certainly a lot of positives um a little technical yeah, technical difficulties there <laughs> see if we can there were certainly a lot of positives, and, and uh, there were some things that we could build off of. Clearly, in, uh, in the first half, we did not do a good enough job of sustaining drives on offense. Even the, the opening drive was fantastic. We were able to establish the run. We, we run a power, pop it through the front side A-gap, uh, hit a long touchdown, which was great. Um, you know, we gave up the, the, the trick play to, you know, to start the, the roll defensively there, but... Uh, I thought we did some good things in the first half, but our inability to sustain drives and, and keep putting our defense back on the field killed us. And, and we just, our margin of error is so slim, we, we can't afford to not convert third and four or makeable third down situations that we had. Um, the challenge to the team at halftime was to, uh, was to simply uh, get on the same page and, and let's compete our tails off. And, and, you know, that's a nationally ranked team, really good, sold-out crowd on the road. You know, the, the, the challenge was to go out and, and go out the second half and, and fight our tails off. And, and we did that and had it down to a one-score game in the fourth quarter, I believe. So, um, you know, while there are things that we simply must do better uh, in places that we need to play better, uh, I was very proud of the effort that they showed and the pride in the fight. Yeah, you guys certainly did a good job of coming back in that second half. And you mentioned got it down to a one-score game. You had it 31-23 after a 32-yard touchdown pass to Hassan Henderson. And then Fresno able to get it out to an 11-point lead. Ultimately won the game by a score of 41-23. But going back to what you talked about a moment ago and the inability to sustain drives in the first half, really put together a nice first drive of the ball game, had the long touchdown run that you talked about. What changed, I guess, after that where the next five possessions of the half you were able only to run 22 plays? What, what, what was the difference between the first drive and the rest of them throughout the first half? You know, I'm, I'm not sure if it's anything more than just simply execution. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I was pleased with our game plan. I thought it was the right one. Um, you know, I, I've heard some, you know, some comments about, you know, their corners were beat up and Look, the bottom line is you still got to protect the passer, and they had a really good front seven and brought pressure from everywhere, and th they were beat up as a football team up front as well, and we felt like if we could establish the run. And the other thing I was very concerned about was um, I didn't want to go three and out too many times. I wanted to try and be able to run the ball and take some time off the clock and give our defense a rest against an opponent that is trying to run 90 plays a game. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're trying to go as fast as they can go. So uh, I, I think it's really just a matter of, you know, runs that we're gaining four yards, we need to finish at the second level. We need to fall forward and make those six-yard gains mm -hmm. and not four-yard gains. And, and in third and short, we need to convert. And in third and manageable, we need to convert. You know, third and five, you, you got to find a way to make some of those, make a catch, make a throw, you know, break a tackle. Instead of having fourth and one, we get a first. You know, we just need to, we need to finish and make plays and keep our offense on the field. It's not very often you look at the final stat sheet and you see, okay, Fresno State 647 yards of offense, and you say, well, I think our defense did some good things. But uh, I know we thought watching the game that we thought your defense really hung in there against a really good offense. What did you like about what your defense was able to get done? Well, I, you know, we competed our tails off. We got off the field three different times on fourth down. Uh, I thought we, when we chose to play some man coverage, uh, you know, I thought certain guys hung in there really, really well. Uh, Carr had only been sacked four times. 
the entire season going into the game. I believe we got him twice. Mm-hmm. And, uh, look, the guy scored a touchdown running. Uh, he didn't want to run. You know, we, we, we covered some people up, and in the end, he got out on us a couple times. And, and, and um, you know, there, there, were, there were positive things to, to build off of there. And, and uh, that team gets yards against everybody. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've scored 50 a bunch of times this year. And uh, take the last touchdown out of it, which, you know, it's neither here nor there. It's the minute they have to go on the clock. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, yards doesn't matter to me. Points per game. And can you create some turnovers, which fourth down stops are turnovers. I mean, it, it's the same thing. You're getting off the field and giving the ball back to your offense. So, you know, we're able to do that a couple times too. So, uh, look, am I thrilled that they got all the yards? No, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of, a lot of positive things there. The, the single most positive thing is that when we went through some adversity and some bad things happened, we didn't panic, we didn't lose our poise, and we kept competing. Let's go back to that fourth down stat for a second because going into the game, Fresno State was 10 of 13 on fourth downs for the season. They had done a tremendous job. And as you said, you got three fourth down stops in the game. How important was that for your guys to be out there and basically have Fresno State say, hey, we think we can get this first down and to come up with those kind of stops? Yeah, and they were, and I believe all three times we're in man coverage and, and one guy's, you know, plays it great. We get some pressure on the quarterback. The ball's got to come out. and. And, um, you know, we play well enough in man coverage to not allow the first down. And, and that, those are things th- that we can build off of. There, we, I said it Tuesday in a press conference. Um, I know our fan base is frustrated right now in our lungs, and everybody wants to be winning more games. Trust me, nobody wants to win more than we do. But there are victories that are occurring that are going to help us uh, in the future. And I know that's hard to hear right now, but... In coaches, we're in the business of small victories. We've got to, you know, you build up enough small victories and you'll win games on a consistent basis. But we're doing certain things better, and, and that's encouraging. And I am I refuse to do anything other than stay positive and keep, keep trying to build off of those things. You know, you talked about the need for some guys to step up, make some of those, those, those big plays, those spark plays for you. I thought Charles Garrett made one of those plays for you in the second half, and it actually set up the touchdown that brought it back to a one-score game. That's going up against a guy in Devontae Adams who's a pretty good wide receiver. He's had a tremendous year. Yeah, Devontae Adams is very talented, and, um, you know, that's a, that's a situation where it's one player and the other player, and it's compete, and our guy wanted the ball more than their guy. And, and um it's a great play, and we've got to, uh, you know, when, when our players are in position to make those plays, we've got to find a way to make more of them. And you saw Hassan Henderson go up in two jump balls mm-hmm. where it's, you know, one guy's got to make a play, and Hassan made it both times. And uh, Charles on the slant rips the ball out. You know, ultimately, you know, there's an old saying, Bill Walsh, you know, uh, the secret to football is good players make good plays. I mean, that's, it's really that simple. And, uh, and our guys are doing a better job, and our playmakers are doing a better job here lately. We're, we're finding a way to make some of those plays. Give me your impressions of Hassan Henderson, clearly forced into duty because of some injuries that you had, and we've seen him a little bit throughout the course of the year. He had to play extended time, made some big plays for you. What would you see from him? He gets better every week. He really does, and, and people – you know, people say, why isn't he out there more? Well, he was a quarterback his whole life. He's been a receiver for less than a year. You know, we moved him in April. So, you know, there's a transition that occurs, and he is doing a great job, and Jim Hoffer is doing a fantastic job of, you know, helping him develop. And his son has really committed himself to it, and, and uh, he's clearly got leaping ability and ball skills. And uh, it's it's the route running and, and understanding uh, – you know, the position that, that are places that he continues to get better, but as he grows more comfortable, his role will increase. As he continues to develop at that position, what kind of weapon can he offer you just with the pure size that he has at that position? He's like another Wimberley where, you know, you say, well, he's not the fastest. Well, in college football, there aren't very many DBs that can match up with him physically. Mm-hmm. And then you, you include the leaping ability and the uncanny ball skills because his hands are gigantic. Um, you know, and he becomes a weapon. And as he's trained, you know, more of a more as a runner, as a you know, as it pertains to playing receiver, 
you know, continue to get better. I mean, he can run fast. He's just one of those guys that he builds up to it a little bit. Yeah. And we've got to get him going a little bit more quick twitch and get off the ball a little faster. But once he does that, he's going to be really, really good. Yeah, and you talked about that, the quick twitch, getting off the ball a little bit quicker. That is something he can develop the more he works at the position, the more comfortable he gets being out there. Yeah, there's no doubt. And in off season with Matt Eck, you can train those things. You can train... You know, you'll never make him great at it. Part of that is God-given ability, but mm -hmm. you can make him significantly better at it to train those muscles to, to fire a little bit faster to get started, and, and we'll do that. How critical is this week for him? I mean, obviously you've said you're going to have to wait till later in the week to make a decision about Richie Turner and Aaron Bradley and these guys that have been banged up. How big is this week for him, getting him ready to, you know, perhaps be in another significant role for you on Saturday? It's big for a lot of people. It's big for son. It's going to be really big for... Jeremy McCauley and uh, Zach Brickell and, um, y you know, uh, Fred Lavulo coming back now off an injury. Um, you know, we're a banged-up football team right now, and I know people don't want to hear that, but it's it's true. You know, we, we, we are not a very deep team to begin with, and now we're, we're, we're nicked up pretty good, and, and there'll be some uh, – There'll be some people. There'll be some faces out there that people aren't used to seeing. If if I had to hazard a guess here on Wednesday night, uh, there are going to be some spots where our usual suspects are going to be up for it. So, uh, you know, it's it's next man up. I mean, that's that's the deal. And and our coaching staff has tried to work very hard this week to to get those those backup guys ready to play and and uh, to try and give them a plan which will. Uh, you know, put them in a, in, a, in a position to succeed. All right, Colorado State coming up on Saturday, 1230 Pacific time for the kick. The Bud Light Tailgate Show begins our coverage at 11 a.m. We'll have more of the Wolfpack Coaches Show live from the Little Wall coming up right after this.
Oh, by the way, that Adobe conversation is one of the nerdiest things I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Welcome back to more of the Wolfpack Coaches Show live here at the Little Wall, presented by Lexus of Reno, who invites you to test drive a luxurious Lexus automobile today. We continue with uh, head coach Brian Pulley and the Wolfpack getting set to travel to Fort Collins to take on Colorado State coming up on Saturday 12:30 Pacific time for the kick and we'll be on the air with the Bud Light tailgate show beginning at 11 a.m. One other thing about uh, Fresno State coach before we move on to uh, this weekend Cody Fajardo ends up with 98 yards rushing. Uh, he suffered the knee injury early uh, in the year which really limited a lot of what he could do running the football but it looked like some of that burst and that explosiveness that we've seen from him in the past was back for him on Saturday. Yeah I thought he did a really good job in the read game and that's been important to us um, you know as you lose a back like Stefan and 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 some of these you know really good offensive linemen that we had from last year as you lose those guys then the threat of the quarterback run really that's what keeps people honest and uh, you know we've executed the read game better here over the last couple of weeks and and while you know people need to remember the guy had a, lig a ligament injury in his knee and while he was healthy enough to come back after a, a two-week break, that doesn't mean he was full speed yet. It meant yeah. he was healthy enough to play the game and be able to protect himself. So clearly he is starting to feel more like himself here over the last two, three weeks. All right, let's talk about uh, the challenge you'll see with Colorado State uh, on Saturday. You mentioned, uh, like you, a team that is fighting for bowl eligibility. Uh, Coach McElwain uh, there at Colorado State here the last couple of seasons. When you look at, at this club on the tape, what, what jumps out at you about the Rams? Well, the first thing is on offense, the multiplicity. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are everywhere. Formations, motions, shifts, personnel groupings, concepts. You know, one play, it'll look like Fresno, four wides, you know, spread offense. The next play, it looks like Stanford. There's two tight ends on the field, two backs, and they're running power at you. So um, the, 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 just the sheer volume of the offense that they run. On defense, they have some difference makers. They have a 330-pound nose tackle who's fairly light on his feet for a guy that size. And they have a kid, Barrett, 56, who's a really terrific edge rusher. So uh, they've got some people for us to contend with. And I know they're a little banged up in the back end, um, you know, and everybody's going to say, well, you ought to throw it 50 times. Well, we've got to protect, too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, un unless, uh, you, you know, you've got to be able to keep Cody upright. And, and if, you're just, if you're just sitting back there and chucking it the whole game and let those, those rushers pin their ears back and, and, and come off the ball with no fear of the run, you know, then I, I don't know if that's an advantage for us either. So, you know, we're going to have to just do what we do and, and stay on schedule and sustain some drives. Yeah, we had uh, a question from Twitter that, that asked about that with all the passing yards they've given up. Are you tempted to just come out and, and chuck the ball at them and use that to set up your run? But I think really, as you just said a minute ago, to do what you do, you have to kind of stay with your balanced approach, right? Yeah, one-dimensional is not good for anybody. And if you are, you better have superior talent if you're going to be one dimensional now our quarterback and our wideouts are the strength of our offense i understand that but um you know you still got you got to protect them and if uh if if the opponent knows exactly what you're doing it's hard capri bibbs has had a very good year running the football for colorado state top five in the league in terms of rushing yardage does he remind you of any of the backs that you've seen over the course of the year no, actually, I, I mean, I, I look at him, and I think he's a very unique guy in the sense that uh, he's not like a Jai. He's not 225 pounds. I want to say he's like 210, mm -hmm. but he's a terrific zone runner. I mean, he uh, you want to talk about a guy that when you watch him on film and say, boy, he really understands the concept of the play and, and really has a knack. And some guys are good zone runners. Some guys are good gap runners. They, they like to run power. They like to run you know, lead, you know, downhill right now. A zone runner's got to be a little bit more patient and, and stretch the defense and, and then be able to see, you know, the point of attack, put his foot in the ground, one cut and go. And, and this guy's got the ability to do that. The other thing worth mentioning, and I believe I'm right, is that he's from Metro Chicago. And that just goes to show now, uh, you can find, you know, your players don't have to come from a 200-mile radius. Mm -hmm. If you can find the right guy and and 
you know, he's attracted to your place for the right reasons, they can come from anywhere. And, and uh, you know, you know, I think when we get to February 5th or 6th, you know, you might end up seeing a guy or two in our recruiting class say, wow, that's an unusual place to get them from. But they're everywhere, and sometimes you, you can find a guy like that. I think that's such a good point because we always think about, okay, Texas and California and Florida and beyond that, well, they're just not there. But there's guys everywhere you look, right? It's just a matter of identifying those guys and trying to find some of those guys. There's no doubt. And you can find those guys maybe that some other places are going to overlook. Yes. In places like that. Absolutely. You know? So. Yep. All right. The other question we had from Twitter, and I thought this was interesting. It, it's, it really relates to what's been a, a big news story here over the last couple of days, which is about what's going on down there in Miami with the Dolphins and everything. And uh, We had a question on Twitter that basically asked, how concerned are you about the hazing right of initiation stuff that goes on? And do you have to take steps to prevent something like this from happening in your program? I think it is a great question. And my first, my, my first thought here to share is that I know John Martin. Uh, John Martin was at Stanford at the same time I was. We were together for two years. And um, he is a really good person. And the thought that's out there right now that he wasn't tough enough to stand up to incognito and that, you know, in some, because he's a football player, this should have turned into a bar ball. I, I give him more credit uh, for going about it the way that he did. Uh, it, it takes far more courage to, to, to report it and remove yourself from the situation than it does to just simply take a swing at the guy. Uh, and, and the thought that football teams want people like Incognito is, uh, is completely, uh, it's ridiculous mm -hmm. to, to think that uh, we would ever want a guy like that. I mean, this is a guy that got thrown out of Nebraska, thrown off the team, transferred to Oregon, was thrown off the team before he ever played a game, uh, went to the Rams, got, I believe, two consecutive 15-yard penalties in a game, and Steve Spagnuolo th cut him from the team then. This is a guy you want on your team? And, and the comments that he made were reprehensible. And, and you know, nobody, nobody can defend the comments. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how we approach it with our program, um, I am from the Tony Dungy school of thought here, and that is uh, when we get new teammates, they are members of our family. And there is no hazing. Uh, there is no rite of passage. We are, uh, you know, our success is going to be determined uh, as a team, and our job is to make our team better and welcome these guys in. And, and hazing is, is not tolerated. Now, do I have a problem with, hey, get up and sing a song? Right. I mean, I had to do that in college. I mean, uh, you know, I don't care if an offensive lineman gets up and sings I'm a little teapot in the cafeteria, you know, whatever. That's, that, that stuff is harmless to me. But anything beyond that, mm -hmm. uh, I, I have an issue with. And, and the defense of incognito as, you know, this is football culture. I was born and raised in football culture. And, and, and I thought my dad said it wonderfully on uh, Mike and Mike in the morning the other day. Uh, you know, Richie incognito. Uh, was not, you know, he was not considered draftable by the Colts. Yeah. You know, they, they had a mark on him, said, do not draft character concerns. And uh, the last time I checked, uh, the guy they picked, Ryan Dean, who was an electrical engineer from Northern Illinois, he's won a whole lot more games than, than uh, Richie Incognito has, and he's got a Super Bowl ring. I thought one of the interesting things of this is you have heard some guys that say, that's just part of the culture, that's just what happens. And I heard Tony Dungy say, it happens if you let it happen. And, and he talked about how he told his teams this isn't going to happen anymore. And I thought that was interesting for some guys to say, well, how do you stop it? That's just what happens. And Tony Dungy said, it's real easy to stop it. You tell them it's not going to happen. Yeah, you don't allow it. It's just like fighting in practice. People say, well, you know, that's just football. You fight in practice. Well, no, it's, it's not because you don't fight in the games. Mm -hmm. If you fight in the game, you get thrown out of the game, possibly suspended. So why would we allow it in practice? Why would we allow a player to risk breaking his hand, throwing a punch, at a helmet. I mean, it just, you know, people say it happens. Yeah, it happens because you let it happen. It doesn't happen if you tell them that you're not allowed to do this. All right, let's take it back to uh, your game coming up on Saturday. Obviously a big game for you guys, three games left, and I know you're, you're going one at a time here. Chance to win all three, still get into a bowl. But what do you tell your team about Saturday? It's your final chance to win on the road this year, and I know that's something you've talked about throughout the year. Good teams find ways to win on the road. What do you need from your ball club here to win this game on Saturday? Well, the, the first thing is, is that we need to do the things that it takes to win on the road. You've got to pack your defense. 
You got to play good defense on the road. We've got to avoid turnovers. We got to cut it out with the penalties, and we got to keep our focus. And if we can do those things, and, and the the overriding theme of all of this is we have to keep chopping wood. I mean, that's I, I know. Trust me, if you're tired of hearing me say it, wait until next September because I'm going to be saying it all off season. And that's uh, you know the only way to get the tree to fall is to is to keep swinging the axe. And and the minute we give up on the season. Uh, nothing positive can happen if we keep fighting and we keep swinging the axe. Uh, you know, we, we can we can win games. Um, you know, for us, if we're going to be a Mountain West title contender here in the next couple of years, we have to learn how to win on the road. Championship teams find ways to win on the road, and and this is our last opportunity to do that this year. And we need to go out and 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 give it our best shot. Kind of hoping you were bringing the blue handled axe with you tonight. I'm, nice I'm afraid. I am afraid to walk around in public with it for fear <laughs> <laughs> that I'll be arrested. <laughs> Don't do that, Don't do that. <laughs> Coach. Good luck on Saturday. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right, Brian Polian joining us here on the Wolfpack Coaches Show. We're live from the Little Wall. It's presented by Lexus of Reno. By the way, Jones West Ford reminds you the next home game is coming up on November 16th. The Pack takes on San Jose State. Tickets are available at 348 Pack or online at NevadaWolfPack.com. Stay tuned. We've got more of the Wolfpack Coaches Show on the way right after this.
from the PA. Five, three, two, <clears throat> one. We continue with more of the Wolfpack Coaches Show live from the Little Waldorf Saloon, Reno's game day headquarters since 1922. The Little Wall where history is made and traditions are celebrated. Nevada takes on Colorado State coming up on Saturday in Fort Collins. 12.30 Pacific time for the kickoff. The Bud Light Tailgate Show begins our coverage at 11 a.m. We are pleased to be joined by Ron Hudson, who is in his first year here as the offensive line coach at uh, the University of Nevada. Before we talk about anything else, there was a very important question uh, that came from, I don't know, B. Polian, something. He, he was asking about the results of the Muskegon-John Carroll game from earlier this year and well, wanted your thoughts on that on the air. You know, I, I, we, don't, we don't often uh, go there uh, talking about this past year. We do talk about the 1984 season when the Fighting Muskies of Muskegon College dominated the John Carroll. I'm not even sure what they're called. <laughs> This year it was a, a tough result. Did you have to buy lunch or dinner I or something? I bought dinner. I bought dinner for the staff. Okay. All right. John Carroll, 41, Muskegon 9. Okay, we're, we're past that. We can, <laughs> we, can, uh, we can move on. Happy birthday, by the Thank way. You. Birthday Thank you. Birthday. I know you're very excited about having you that out there. really happy about publicly. that, too. <laughs> hey, let's talk about uh, the group that, that you've worked with this year, Coach, because uh, obviously some youth, some inexperience. Right. Uh, it's been a, a, a year of growth. I think it's been a tough year at times for, for the guys up front. Just overall, give us kind of a snapshot of, of what you've seen from these guys and, and how you feel about what they've done here so far this season. Well, you know, when I came in in January, um, they um, basically the third or fourth coach for them in the last three or four years, mm -hmm. uh, as they've had some kind of turnover here in that position. And uh, I, I was, you know, there are some great kids. That, that, that the union is a great tradition. Mm -hmm. There are some great kids that were lost off the team from the year before, some great linemen that played a bunch of football. Some of them are still playing. And uh, But I came in. Uh, was fortunate. Uh, the Joe Batonio was a senior, and he was our only senior when, mm -hmm. when I came in there. And uh, he, right off the bat, he welcomed me and immediately made me feel comfortable coaching those guys. And, and uh, you know, again, could, as, as good as he is, uh, humbled himself and said, hey, coach, what can you do to help me get better? And, and has just done a great job of taking coaching, uh, you know, working with me, work, doing the things that we have to do to get better, in, in my opinion. The direction we want to go he just embraced it and bought into it uh, you know wholesale so so from the start the, the the best player I felt like that we had really bought into what we were doing and then from there you know we had, we had a, a lot of competition in the spring we had a bunch of guys that had played very little football mm -hmm. that we knew we were gonna have to depend on so you know we, we had a bunch of guys compete and I've enjoyed the process I've enjoyed the kids I've enjoyed those guys becoming more mature and we've had some guys that, that uh, stepped up and played some guys that didn't play maybe quite as well or gotten dinged and hadn't played quite as much and mm -hmm. uh, had some surprises you know uh, Jimmy McCauley from right here in town is playing a whole bunch of football and uh, he's a great kid he's a great he's a great young man to be around and uh, kind of kind of a unique background about him you know fighting and scrapping trying to say hey I want to come play football here I want to play division one football and don't have a scholarship start off the bat but I don't care I think I can play here and uh, and he's earned it. He, I mean, he's he's earned all the respect from the entire staff and the entire team. Done a great job. So we've got some good kids. You got Kyle Roberts is a, is a local product here, who's uh, done a tremendous job playing for us. So uh, you know, we, we're really excited about the kind of kids we've got playing. Uh, you know, like I said, a lot of them didn't have a ton of experience, mm -hmm. but they've come in, they've embraced it, and they played really hard. And, and I'm proud of where where they've come. And I'm looking forward to the direction we're headed. When you have the the inexperience that you have, how tough is it then when you start looking at the schedule and say, "We got to play UCLA, we got to play Florida State," and then after that, here comes the conference season. The, you don't have really that time to say, "Okay, they can just go out and get their feet wet and start to go." Right off the bat, you're playing against some of the best guys in the country. Exactly, and you know. While it's challenging, you know, especially in my position, I don't think I don't think you focus on who you're playing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because this this is is so much about the unit. It's a, so much about it's so much about them working together, mm -hmm. about them growing together and learning each other and learning what what calls mean what, and then how do you abbreviate it because of of, of the time of the situation and how do you change it? How do we have two or three words that mean the same thing so the guy doesn't know what we're doing? And how do we all stay on the same page? So. You know, you're really more focused on what you're doing. You know, every week there's going to be something different. There's going to be a new opponent. There's going to be new challenges. Uh, you know, this, this conference is a great conference, but it's kind of a, a junky conference when it comes to defenses. You know, because everybody throws it so much and there's a lot of pass rush and mm -hmm. a lot of different blitzes and a lot of different stuff happening. You know, every week's a new challenge. Everybody's got a couple of good pass rushers. Everybody's got kind of a unique front or a unique package. So, 
You know, really what you got to do is focus on your fundamentals, getting better at what you do every day, and then within your scheme, letting those fundamentals play themselves out and letting your kids have success. If you focus so much on each capsule of a, of a, of a game week on just what they're doing instead of what you're doing, by the end of week four or five, all of a sudden, everything kind of runs together. Mm -hmm. So every week you get back to saying, okay, are we taking a good first step here? Are we taking a good pass set here? Have we ID'd the right guy? Are we on the same page? Are all five guys playing on the same page together? That's really our focus every week. You know, how, how, you know, what we see in front of us may change, so it's got to kind of adjust how we do some things. But it still comes back to are we in a good stance? Are we taking a good first step? Are we having, do we have a good pass set? You know, and are we on the same page? So that's what we're working, about, working on every week, whether it's UCLA, Florida State, uh, Fresno State, Colorado State. It doesn't make any difference to us. We just want to get better at, at our craft every day. And I, I found in the past that when you do that, then really good things happen. Your, your team gets better, your line plays better, and everybody's happier. As you go forward in building these guys that have played this year and getting them more experience and also bringing new players into the program that yep. can help build depth and, and challenge for spots and make the O-line better as a whole, mm -hmm. what are you looking for? When, you, when you're out there looking at O-linemen, what are you looking for in your guys going forward? You know, I'm, and everybody's got their own opinion. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got what they like. And some of this I've had success with, and some of it's just sort of, sort of, you know, my personal bias. But I, I'm, I'm a big fan of smart guys. I think smart guys help you win. Um, and I like athletic guys. I'm not – I like size. I, you know, I'll talk, guys will ask me all the time, recruits, well, coach, how big do you want me? And I'll tell them, I want you as big as you can possibly be and be fast and quick. Mm -hmm. And if, if you can get to 340 and be fast and quick, get to 340. If you can't get above 290 and be fast and quick, then stay at 290 mm -hmm. because I want you fast and quick. We don't play, in a, we don't play in, a, in a world where everybody's 300 pounds. We play in a world where everybody's fast. Mm -hmm. And so I want my guys to be as athletic and as quick as they can be, and I like them to be smart. You know, um, you know I, I love, I, I've had a great experience here thus far. I love this university. I love recruiting for this university. Mm -hmm. Uh, but one of the things, you know, you, you can't be a dumb guy and go here. It, it, it doesn't work that way. It's a great school. It's a challenging school. And in my opinion, for the position I coach, I think that's right down our alley. I want smart guys. I want guys that not just want to get a degree. They want to get a good degree. That, that's important to them. Because what I find is a guy that, that values an education, okay, he's, he's self-motivated. He's got a pride to him, a personal pride. That, that I think is important in an offensive line. Guys got guys to want to work hard. There's, gotta, there's not a whole bunch of glory in what we do. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of self-satisfaction if you're that kind of guy, if you're the kind of guy that's satisfied with a, a hard day's work and accomplishing something with a group of guys that are your brothers and you sweated and worked hard together. And, it, and if you gain satisfaction in that, you're the right kind of guy for us. And what I find is those guys, most often or not, they may not be 4.0s, but if, but if they're a 3.0, they're getting a 3.0. Yeah. They're, not, they're not a 3.0 student that's getting a 2.4 just because they're, they're smart enough to get by and they're hanging out. They realize that their resume is, is on that grade sheet, is in that classroom. You know, that, that talks about the kind of person they are. And those are the kind of guys I want. So I'm looking for smart guys. Guys, again, they don't have to be 4.0, but they care about how, they, how they're perceived. Mm -hmm. They care about the work they turn in. They care about the work they do in the weight room. They care about what's said about them. They're, that's important to them. What they put out there on the field, on paper, in the weight room, that matters. And I like those kind of guys because I think those kind of guys are self-motivated. They've got a hot button. You can reach, you can, every now and then you can lean over and whisper in their ear, hey, you know, this is what's going on. This mm -hmm. is what's happening. This is what the world sees. And, and you don't have to say much more. They get cranked up and they go get after it. Those kind of guys are fun to coach. They're, they're motivated to prepare, to win. And the next thing you know, you see results on the field that you didn't even imagine. You see a guy pick up a twist. You see a guy ID a blitz. And you're going, wow, you know, we, we didn't even have a chance to cover that marriage. We just talked about it one day briefly. Well, you know what? He spent 30 more minutes in the film rooms looking at yeah. it, too. And he saw it. He saw what I talked about in that, in that Wednesday afternoon meeting. And he ID'd it on the field. And we picked it up and we scored. Yeah. And, and, and those are the kind of things that you don't always see. They're not the things that are on the stat sheet. But they're the things that that young man, and the, those are the kind of young men we want, those guys take personal pride in of, hey, no stone was left unturned. When I got done playing, when they blew the whistle the last time, I gave everything I had. Well, we look forward to seeing a lot of those guys, and we look forward to the continued maturation of the group that you have right now. Coach, it's a pleasure to have you here at the University of Nevada, and thanks for giving us a few minutes tonight. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Ron Hudson, our guest, offensive line coach at the University of Nevada. More of the Wolfpack Coaches Show live from the Little Wall coming up right after this.
Wall continues. Nevada gets set to take on Colorado State coming up on Saturday. We'll welcome defensive end Lenny Jones to the program. And really, we can share the secret now that Lenny owes most of his success on the field to this program, as he uh, pointed out before. Would you like to go ahead and tell folks what happened last time you appeared on this show and how it spurred you on to the great success you had on the field? Yeah, uh, we did an interview, and uh, after that, <laughs> yeah, go I, ahead. I ended up with four sacks that month. That's so. right. Uh, dominated. Yeah, dominated. Yes. So you can expect yes. the same thing. Okay. So if you get a sack on Saturday, can I count on you pointing to the press box to acknowledge the real reason for your success? Most definitely. Okay, good. We will uh, get that <laughs> ready, and uh, we'll be ready to see that on Saturday. Tell me where you guys are defensively. Uh, you look at the Fresno game, and Coach Pullian and I talked about this earlier. You see all the yards and say, boy, you know, the defense just got torched. But it seemed like in the second half, you guys really hung in there against a really talented, really good offense. Where, where do you see this defense right now here as you get set for the stretch run of the season? Um, we improve every week in different things. Like one week, it's uh, just the pass rush wasn't there. And mm -hmm. then the next week, we look explosive. Mm -hmm. And then the back end is something shaky back there. And then the next week, they're all on it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of coming together. And uh, I wish this... This gelling, how the defense is gelling right now, happened mm -hmm. a little earlier mm -hmm. because there's only three games left, so mm -hmm. we have to put it all together right now. But uh, it's, it's looking pretty good, and I think this little stretch of the season, we'll, I think we'll really put it together. And yeah. How frustrating as a pass rusher when you play against a guy like Derek Carr, who throws so many of the quick screens and the ball is out of his hands so quick, you really don't get much of an opportunity to get near the guy. How, how tough is that as a defensive lineman to play in a game like that? Um, you go you go, you go, go and say, this is when I, I get on film and I go chase down a receiver or something. Mm -hmm. But you know that he's going to have to take those three to five step drops. And when you get your chance, you got to make the most of it. Rakeem got a sack. Mm -hmm. Brock got a sack. Um, I hit him once, but it was just a second too late. Uh, I mean, we always get opportunities. You always get your opportunities, mm -hmm. but... Uh, it's not really frustrating because in, that, in those type of games, they're going to run 80, 80 snaps. You're going to get a chance to do what you got to do. Yeah, 88 plays that Fresno State ran on Saturday. What do you feel like after 88 plays on a football field? Uh, you don't feel too good. So you wake <laughs> up and you come in, you get a stretch, you go cold tub. And, I mean, if you take care of your body – Mm -hmm. Around it, well, it's it's pivotal. You take care of your body around this time, mm -hmm. especially running that many plays against you know these type of teams that we're playing against. Yeah. And uh, if you if you take care of your body around this time, you'll beat most you'll beat most players who are just taking yeah. it easy. Lenny Jones is our guest here on the Wolfpack Coaches Show. Now, you guys all play a, a kind of a rotation up there on the defensive line, but a couple of weeks ago, a depth chart comes out, and Ian Sayow was listed as a starter, and you're listed behind him. You proceeded then to come out and have a terrific game. I believe it was the Boise game. You had the interception and, and really played well. I mean, you know you're still going to play, but does that light a fire under you when all of a sudden your name isn't atop the depth chart of the defensive end spot? Yeah. Uh, I mean, we all want to start. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm stuck at 19. I need to get to 20. <laughs> and, uh, no, I mean, when you look at it, it's – I mean, everybody wants to start. But at the end of the, those past three, four games – when you look at when our coaches grade us out, I'm at 51 plays. He's at 40. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, it's not really a big deal. I come right. in and I make an impact. And, frankly, I've been playing better coming off the bench than I was when I was starting. So, I mean, I really don't mind, but, I mean, everybody wants yeah. to start. Well, and it's worked out well because yeah. Ian's playing well. You're playing well. Of course, Brock's had a, a terrific year on the other side. Okay, we've got to be quick here. we only got about 40 seconds. But I'm going to revisit a topic we had with you last year on the show. You were a terrific high school basketball player. Check out the YouTube highlight videos, by the way. They're still yes, up there. pizza time. So give me your starting five Wolfpack football players on the basketball court. Joel Batonio. Okay. Brandon Wimberly. Okay. Myself. Okay. Aaron Bradley. Okay. Ah. Uh, you got one more spot to fill. And the fifth will go to, oh, oh, I'll give it to Jericho Richardson. Jericho Richardson. Yeah. All right. And I pity whoever has to guard Joel Batonio on the low Me block, too. by the way. Me too. That would be <laughs> tough. Hey, Lenny, it's always fun to have you, man. We wish you nothing but success going forward. Hopefully a couple of wins here down the stretch to get you guys back to that bowl Three game. wins in a row. I'm predicting it now. Thanks so much for coming down, man. Appreciate it. All right. Thank Lenny, you. Lenny Jones with us here on the Wolfpack Coaches Show. Look for the sack on Saturday. It's coming. We'll be back to wrap it up right after this.
That's a clock. Three, two, one. Hey, folks, if you're craving more Wolfpack action, be sure to keep up on all of Wolfpack Athletics with uh, News 4's Wolfpack All Access, presented by Champion Chevrolet, Coach's Perspective, Highlights, and so much more. Wolfpack All Access airs every Sunday night, right after NFL Sunday Night Football on News 4. Nevada, Colorado State coming up on Saturday again, 12.30 for the kick. We'll be on the air with the Bud Light Tailgate Show at 11 o'clock, and we'll see you again right here next week for the Wolfpack Coaches Show, presented by Lexus of Reno.